I'm Flavia Bellieni Zimmerman from the Australian Institute of International Affairs in Western Australia and today we have with us Carl Wilson. Carl is a former Australian diplomat and he has been seconded to the Office of National Assessments as a senior Russian analyst, is a fellow at the Australian University, Australian National University and today we are going to be discussing his experience in Russia and Russian foreign policy. Thank you for being with us, Carl. It's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Carl, um, you have studied in Moscow and Leningrad during the Cold War period. Would you please share with us um, some interesting things you might have witnessed while living there? It's very difficult to convey to people who've never lived in uh, a non-cash economy or in a country where the economy is centrally planned uh, and a country where there's no multi-party system just what it felt like it's very difficult sometimes I'm asked by students to tell me tell them how it felt it felt very gray so you see there's no advertising there are very few cars at night the streets are dark mm. um, the verb to buy disappeared from the Russian language because you didn't buy things. If a bureaucrat sitting in Moscow decides exactly what the state will produce, then it becomes a matter of getting hold of things, not buying them. Um, to, to go into a little slightly risque area, so the state might decide that, for instance, condoms are not to be produced, nor tampons. You can't get them. Uh, buying a teapot was very difficult. You want to buy a tracksuit? some sports gear. There's only one made for the whole country. 260 million people, there's one tracksuit. It's all the same. It's a bit like Mao suits in China. Mm. And it was, of course, in those, that was the 1970s, and Russia was aging, and it was ruled by these boring old men. Their, their average age was about 70, and there were all sorts of jokes about how the, the leader of the country, Mr. Brezhnev, was always followed around by a little band of nurses. You know, to revive him. You know, and, they were all, and so it was very grey. And the politics was grey, but against that you had a very lively society because one of the ways that people dealt with this greyness was humour. Mm. And the jokes were terrific. And because the state tried to control what people read, people were very curious. And so, for instance, the greatest Russian novel of the 20th century, Bulgakov's Master and Margarita, had not been published because the party didn't like it. No, it was a little bit like Pablo Neruda in Chile, you know, the greatest poet can't be published, you know. Um, and so that's what, but people's ingenuity at getting hold of, you know, a copy of Master and Margarita, and then this book would pass through a thousand hands, and it would fall apart because it had been so deeply read. Mm. So, and there was the final thing I'd say to you is there was a sense of us and them. Mm. There was the people who rule and there's us the people. So there was a lot of intellectual ferment. And so day-to-day -day life was hard, getting food was hard, getting, keeping warm was hard. Um, get, you couldn't get a cup of coffee. But the intellectual ferment, you know, the, the conversations between people, absolutely fascinating. So I found it a very stimulating time. And it, but there was no change. And that's why the Soviet Union fell, because it failed to adapt to the times, because these old men were so frightened of change. Mm. Thank you very much, Carl. And uh, from the time of the Cold War period and the fall of the Berlin Wall, how have you seen Australian-Russian relations evolve? Russian relations? Oh, for time of the... Okay. Well, when you had the Soviet Union, it was one of the biggest buyers of Australian wool. So there was a big trading relationship between Australia and the Soviet Union. Multi-billion dollar trade. When the Soviet Union collapsed, that trade collapsed. And because Russia, as it was called when the Soviet Union collapsed, the Russian Federation was of limited interest really to Australia. Essentially, the relationship declined into one of secondary importance. I mean, for Australia, what were the priorities? The priorities were Japan, the United States, Indonesia, 
increasingly India, but not Russia. Mm. So really from about 1993-94 through to about, I'd say, 2010, it was a relationship of not much substance. There was an early period of intense optimism when Australian business thought that all these opportunities were opening up in Russia. So we established a consulate in Vladivostok. We put an embassy into Kazakhstan. This was driven by Australian business because they saw big profits because of the rich resource endowment of those countries. This was a period of dashed hopes. All these hopes came to nothing because when the Soviet Union collapsed, the system of administration collapsed and there was no protection for investment. So people basically did their dough. But we had an Australian restaurant in Vladivostok called the Captain Cook Restaurant. It lasted for four years, but then the Russian mafia came one day and said to the owner, Eric, we like you. We're very glad you've invested this money in Vladivostok, but it would be good for your health if you got on a plane tomorrow. Here's a ticket. And they just took the restaurant because it was the Wild East. So in those early years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was great hopes, a lot of optimism, a lot of energy. Um, but gradually, of course, it all subsided because you simply cannot move from one system to a new system quickly. And it really wasn't until Mr. Putin came along in 2001 that things began to stabilize. Other big factor was the oil price went up. Mm. Putin was very lucky. Anyway, for the last three or four years, thanks to Mr. Putin putting Russia back on the map, this relationship between Australia and Russia has acquired more substance. But you'd have to say that for Australia, Russia still today is not a primary priority. China, the United States, Indonesia, those are the priorities. Russia is a secondary priority. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Carl. And uh, regarding Russian foreign policy, and particularly uh, under Vladimir Putin's leadership, how do you see Russia possibly flexing its military muscle and becoming more assertive in the world and its region, and also the role that Russia has been playing in the Syrian conflict by keeping the Assad regime in power. How do you see Russian foreign policy evolving and, and how do you think they will place themselves in the region? Russia is a country like some others where you have to think very, very carefully about your terminology. I don't think there is such a thing as Russian foreign policy. There is policy. And some of it affects foreign countries, some of it is directed at Russia. But Russia's foreign relations are driven by domestic priorities. In 2013, Mr. Putin's approval rating was down to 60%. He then took Crimea and his approval rating went to 80%, even higher. Within Russia itself, as I said, you have one of the things that today's Russia has inherited from the Soviet Union is fear of change. Putin and the men around him who rule Russia watched, saw what happened when Mikhail Gorbachev tried to reform the Soviet Union. It collapsed. Mikhail Gorbachev didn't set out to destroy the Soviet Union. He wanted to bring it up to date. He wanted to modernize it. Well, the men around Putin and Putin himself are very wary of change. But they need somehow to underpin their stability and their legitimacy. They've been there for 18 years. People are getting tired of them. And one way they have learned to restore the legitimacy, to reinforce their legitimacy, to underpin it, is successes abroad. And so three times they have used military power, unprovoked, unprovoked, to change Russia's borders. First in Georgia in 2008, mm. then with the annexation of Crimea, and then when they moved into the Donbass. That's on three occasions. These have proved very popular domestically. So I would say to you that if you ask Mr. Putin what he wants, he would probably say, I like my job and I intend to remain in it, at least until 2024. I can't reform Russia internally. It's too dangerous to do so. So the lesser evil is non-modernization. But at the same time, I will pursue Russia's interests abroad and not assertively, but aggressively, threateningly, 
because it's very, very good for me domestically. Mm. Of course, he wouldn't say that. And he would, if he were to speak to you honestly, he would other, what, his story to you would be this. Russia is different. Russia is unique. Russia is under attack. Russia must be defended. I am defending Russia from its many enemies. That's all I'm doing. And that is what I'm doing in the Middle East, where Russia has ISIS as an enemy. But my own personal view, it's just a personal view, is that Putin's campaign in Syria is fundamentally about Ukraine. His priority is a friendly government in Kiev, a government which will support him and not oppose him, which will not try and join Europe. Syria is a bargaining chip for him to deal with the United States of America. And now, obviously, it's not that simple. When someone like Putin takes the decision to send military force, by the way, it's quite a small military force, 33 planes and about 5,000 troops, into Syria, there's a whole range of factors that he has to weigh up. Why is this in our interest? But I think if you had to is isolate one factor, it would be that this campaign enhances his standing domestically and makes it easier for him to ensure that he will rule for another six years without a theory, serious threat. Mm. That's a personal view. Mm, thank you very much, Carl. So, in your opinion, um, the upcoming uh, presidential elections in 2018, do we have any prospects of having a change of government? None whatsoever. Um, partly because elections in Putin's Russia are not elections. I mean, the Russian word for elections is vybore. Vybore means choices. <laughs> in a presidential election in Russia, you don't really have a choice. And the election is essentially a ritual for legitimizing the man who is in power. Mm -hmm. And for that, he needs three things. He needs a turnout of 70%, and a voting in Russia is optional. So a lot of pressure will be put on people to come out and vote. University students will be told that if they want to pass their exams, they had better sh do their patriotic duty and go and vote. People turning up to hospital emergency services will be told, can you prove that you have voted? If you can, we'll let you into the hospital. All these tricks will be used to get a 70% turnout so that, as it were, the population re-anoints the Tsar. You are legitimate because 70% of the people have voted for you. The second thing they need is a credible candidate. Mm -hmm. And they still don't have one. Uh, a young socialite called Subchuk, Xenia Subchuk, has announced that she will run. And this is not a credible candidate. The only credible candidate would be Mr. Navalny. But they're worried about Mr. Navalny because young people like him and he's campaigning on corruption. Mm -hmm. And corruption is one area where Putin is vulnerable. Maybe it's the only area where he's vulnerable. Because corruption, of course, is huge in Russia. It's number 131 on the Global Corruption Index. It's there with, you know, Guatemala. But he can't touch it because that corruption underpins the system. If he wants the support of all the people that matter, he can't touch their money. So there's not much he can do about corruption, although we're getting more and more trials of people who are corrupt. So a bit like the Chinese, you know, they're, they're trying to show they're doing something. But Navalny would be a credible candidate against Putin. If Putin could win against Navalny, I think it would greatly legitimize, enhance his legitimacy. I think it's very unlikely they'll take the risk. So they have to find someone who's a credible candidate, then have what's called the election, which is in fact a ritual. But then they have to come up with a program for the next six years. Because as soon as the election is over, people will start saying, under the Constitution, in six years' time, Putin has to leave. So what's going to happen then? And of course, in Russia, unlike many other countries, there's no succession mechanism. There's no way of passing over power to your successor and feeling safe yourself. Mm -hmm. So to, to relinquish power, Putin will need to find a protector, just as Yeltsin found a protector in Mr. Putin. Otherwise, in a way, you know, he's sort of caught on a wheel that he can't get off. Mm. He has to stay in the job. And all the people around him will be terribly worried if he moves because they are attached to him. And they'll be afraid that if he goes down, they'll go down with him. So you have this conundrum. Okay? That's my view. Thank you but very much. But you will much. not see a change of power. No. Thank you very much, Carl. Just wrapping up our interview now. Carl, we were just mentioning um, the quest that Russia has to protect 
Mother Russia. And particularly if Vladimir Putin a return to traditional values. Recently, Russia has enacted a legislation which condones uh, domestic violence. Could you please explain a little bit more how this view on traditional values is being pushed by Vladimir Putin in Russia? The real shift towards presenting Russia as a bastion of traditional values against a decadent West and against terrorism began quite early on, but in Putin's time, to differentiate Russia. But it was really after he had the fright in 2011-2012 when people came out in the streets to demonstrate against him. It was in 2013, at the beginning of his third term, that clearly a decision was taken that we will present Russia in two ways. Number one, as a besieged fortress, under threat from the West, mm -hmm. and number two, under threat because it is the bastion of traditional values. That is, family values, um, uh, religion, uh, patriotism. These particular values was decided would be in the country's interest to inculcate these values and to draw sharp contrasts between Russia and what Russia calls the West. I mean, how you define the West these days, I have no idea. I have no idea. Um, clearly it means the United States, and it tends these days to mean the Anglo-Saxon countries. Canada, United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand. Um, Russia, of course, is not a monolithic place. There's a whole range of opinions. Mm -hmm. And the Duma, the parliament, which of course is really not it's not a true parliament, it's an ersatz parliament, which always supports Putin, um, tends to be full of old men and older women. And of course, they tend to be very conservative in their outlook. But I'd be surprised if 100% of the deputies of the Duma actually support legislation which condones domestic violence in certain circumstances. But politicians are driven by their perceptions of what is good for them. And quite clearly, the people who rule Russia, quite clearly, have decided that legislation, which in certain circumstances condones domestic violence, suits their domestic political imperatives. I guess that would be my answer. But I'm sure that there would be many Russians of the younger generation who are uncomfortable, particularly among women, mm -hmm. who are uncomfortable because, in a way, this is sort of freezing Russia in the 20th century or in the 19th century and it seems to me exemplifies the way in which Russia's rulers today tend to look back to a glorified past when things were better rather than looking forward. I mean, once you win an election, so called, in March 2018, you would think that Putin would say, there are very many fine things about our country. We have a great country, a powerful country, a country that people respect. but." there must be ways to improve it. What about our health system? What about our pension system? What about our education system? What about technology? We really should, we, I have an ambitious program to improve the lives of Russians and it will focus on change to take us forward into the 21st century. But I'd be very surprised if you will hear anything like that. Mm. It tends to be this harking back to a glorified, idealized past and these so-called traditional values. And of course, his handmaiden and his support in this regard is the Russian Orthodox Church, which in Russia has always been inextricable from the state. Mm -hmm. Inextricable from the state. Thank you very much, Carl. It's fascinating pleasure. talking to you. And uh, thank you for being with us. For more information, please visit our website, www.internationalaffairs.org.au. Thank you.